Welcome to the remote lecture, molecular biology, lecture number two, 11th of January on 2017. Um, there are 14 inches of snow at my house, and as I'm sure most of you know, PSU is closed today. We'll be <clears throat> going through a little bit of the genomes lecture that we didn't get to in the first lecture, and then we'll be talking a little about the chemistry that you need to know as far as today um, is concerned. Um, have a couple of clicker questions that we won't actually use, and there'll be a few more on Friday, assuming that we actually have class. One of the clicker questions here that you can think about, uh, maybe we can discuss on D2L, is from a molecular point of view, there's the most diversity in bacteria, animals, plants, fungi, or humans. Um, and as usual with these clicker questions, just like my exam questions, there'll be one correct answer for these, or the most correct answer, as the case may be. So I wanted to talk a little bit about genomes, and the first question as far as genomes are concerned is if anyone can figure out why I have this particular icon down here in the corner, um, you will get un <clears throat> fettered praise, but I'm afraid I won't give you any extra points. Um, I may get around to talking about this in the next lecture as well. But what most people think about genomes, that's this here. This is a relatively small genome. This is all of the genetic material from a particular organism. In this case, E. coli, the K12 strain, probably one of the best studied living organisms around. Um, a relatively large bacterial genome at about four, a little over four and a half million base pairs. What you can see on here are a couple of things. All of the protein coding genes are either in orange here on the outside or yellow on the inside. And then various RNA encoding genes are here on the inside. One of the things that we might have talked about last time is that genes can not only be those genes that are coding for proteins, but could also be what's coding for RNA. What can you find in a genome? One of the things that is discussed at quite length in the textbook is how many genes you actually need as a cellular organism. Um, the quote from the textbook is actually fewer than 500 up here and two to 300 genes that are actually found in all cellular organisms. Uh, this is a plot right here, in fact, from a paper from 2006, looking at the size of the genome in megabase pairs. So E. coli would be right about in here. Um, and then just compared to the content of GCs, the last we talked about last time, you know, Gs and Cs and As and Ts are those that are pairing with each other. And just one way to separate out genomes is by the percentage of Gs and Cs relative to As and Ts we have present in the genome. This particular paper is actually about this organism right here, Carcinella rudi, which is a symbiont. It just can only function when it's inside a, another cell. Um, this particular one is a symbiont of aphids. Um, it only has 182 open reading frames. Open reading frames I think I haven't talked about yet, ORFs. Um, that basically is a protein coding gene or a potentially protein coding gene. And the vast majority of those 182 genes, which you'll notice are a lot less than the fewer than 500, and then two to 300 completely common genes are almost all involved in translation and amino acid metabolism. Also on this plot, um, you can see quite nicely is right over here. Um, some of the largest bacterial genomes, it's just bacterial genomes, are almost 10 million base pairs in size. Um, the Carcinella genome is actually down here. Each of those blocks here, these different colored stripes, are in fact just the same as all of these orange and yellow stripes that we had on the last side here. These are actually protein coding genes. The largest bacterial genomes may only be <clears throat> 10 megabase pairs in size and maybe a million base pairs. And 
on average, they're about three to four million bases in size. But if you think about the vast number of different microbes that are present in our gut, one of the things that becomes really obvious is there are actually more than a hundred times more different protein coding genes in the bacteria in our gut than there are in the entire human genome. Turns out there actually aren't very many protein coding genes in the entire human genome. We'll get to that a little bit later on. So one of the big questions as far as looking at these genome sizes is really sort of how do you get a big genome? And to some extent, why are some bacteria having genomes that are 10 million bases in size and some which are you know, less than a million bases in size? In fact, the Carcinella genome here, sorry for flipping back and forth, um, is only 160,000 base pairs in length. Really pretty amazing. Um, and even if you do have these you know, two to 300 common genes, Almost all of the bacterial organisms have literally thousands of genes that are present in there, and in the E. coli genome, you actually have about 3,000 genes. So how do you go from a potential you know, primordial organism, probably with about three or 400 genes, to something like the E. coli genome with thousands of genes, or to we look at the human genome, actually about 20,000 genes. So one of the big questions that people have asked is where do new genes come from? How can you undergo evolution? So there's a couple of different ways that this happens. The first one is outlined up here at the top. Um, this is what most people think about when you think about evolution. You have a particular gene here in orange and there's a mutation that happens in that gene, usually a single point mutation, etc. Um, this can give you a new gene, innovation in genetics, but what it doesn't do is really add to your genome. This, you know, if this one had a function, this one had a different function, that's really not going to help you very much. Probably most of what's going on in terms of evolution of genomes has to do with gene duplication. And there are lots of different ways you can get gene duplication. We'll talk about some of them later on in the course. But once you've had gene duplication, now you can have mutations that happen in one of those genes and get you a new function. And this one only has the single function here. Another thing that can happen is you can have two different genes that undergo what they call shuffling, We'll see later this is very often present between different domains of proteins and this can end up giving you two different genes encoding different proteins. What I think is probably the most important, potentially slightly behind, behind gene duplication, is this process here called horizontal transfer. And what we mean by horizontal transfer is that when you have normally you know, organism A is going to replicate and give you two copies of organism A, those are gonna have the same genetic content. But if somehow one of these genes from organism A happens to be able to get over here to organism B, then you can generate a lot of genetic diversity in organism B extremely rapidly. You don't have to have you know, a couple of point mutations, gene duplications, etc. And this horizontal transfer probably in the very, very origins of life was extremely important for genome evolution. This brings me to a very important point, and we're going to be talking about this quite a bit um, throughout the rest of the course, and it just has to do with homology, orthologs, and paralogs. Homology when you talk about a gene homology, it's also true for all kinds of other different structures. Homology just means that you have a common ancestry. So <clears throat> any of a duplicated gene is going to be a homologous gene. And usually you can detect homology by looking at sequence similarity in various different genes. There are two general kinds of homologs that you find in genetic sequences. And basically, these are two ways that you can get similar kinds of genes. You can have a <clears throat> mutation process, which happens here between 
your ancestral organism, which is divided, and in each of these two different offspring here, developing to different species, you have mutations that lead to this gene and mutations that lead to this gene. But they're still both related to this ancestral gene right here. So they're both homologs, but in this case, because these two different genes are in different organisms, then these are going to be called orthologs. And ortholog <clears throat> basically having almost always the same function. On the other hand, if you have gene duplication, as we talked about just on the last slide, and then one of those genes undergoes modification, could in fact be both of those genes undergoing modification, and you have two genes present in the same organism, each of which came from this same gene in the first place, these are now paralogs. And very often, paralogs actually have different function relative to each other. Now, why are we talking about this? Um, basically because vast proportions of our genome and many, many other genomes are filled with these orthologs and paralogs relative to each other. So I wanted to talk about another example here. This is the true example. This is the tubulin gene. There are two groups of tubulins that were clearly related to one tubulin to start with. So all of these different tubulins, be they alpha tubulins or beta tubulins, are all homologs of each other. Here you had a gene duplication, and then these become two different species, etc. And if you look all together at this relationship of these tubulin genes to each other, kind of like that tree that we talked about in the first lecture, just lining them up relative to each other, the sequence differences, they determine the length of each of these bars between each other. You notice that all the alpha tubulins are more similar in sequence to each other than the beta tubulins are to each other. These, <clears throat> all of these alpha tubulins here are orthologous to each other because they've all developed from this one same gene here and they've divided through speciation. On the other hand, the duplication between alpha tubulin and beta tubulin is happening in the same organism. So these are paralogs. And you can also see this over here. If you look at the alpha tubulin in humans and the beta tubulin in humans, that's a paralog. Alpha tubulin in fly is a paralog of the beta tubulin in flies, etc. Again, these are all homologs. They're going to be orthologs if they've divided relative to different speciation down here. They'll be paralogs if they've come from a gene duplication process. And at this point, I normally ask if people have any questions about orthologs and paralogs, uh, but you can go ahead and do that online. I'm happy to do this on D2L as the process may be. Just uh, thinking to myself, yeah, I didn't think this was going to be an online course, but with all these snow days, it might actually be looking much more like an online course, relatively speaking. Then I want to talk a little bit about lateral gene transfer. Um, the book talks about sex as being um, an example of lateral gene transfer. Um, and again, lateral gene transfer, horizontal gene transfer, are genes coming from two different organisms coming together. And if you think about it from the sex point of view, it's a half the genes from one organism, half the genes from another organism. I, of course, like to think of this from my favorite kinds of biological entities. Again, we can argue if these are organisms later. Um, these are viruses, and viruses are absolutely wonderful at moving genes from one cell to another cell. And you can, in fact, see in these amazing micrographs here um, where you have DNA contained in this particular virus capsid, the head of this virus, that DNA being transferred into a cell, and now there's no longer any DNA that's actually left there. So one way, and this is probably very important early on, and when I say early, I mean billions of years ago in cellular evolution, for moving genes around, it was probably very much viral in terms of how these things got moved around. So through the process of horizontal gene transfer, be it sex or viral, gene duplication and divergence, one of the things that happened is you end up with what are called gene families. Let's back up here a little bit. Um, 
a gene family is something like this, the tubulin gene family. All of these are homologs to each other. They could be orthologs. They could be paralogs. If you look now in <clears throat> the all of the domains of the living world, you find a number of gene families. And again, these are just orthologs and paralogs, all present in the same organism. You see a couple of things. These are all clearly related genes, clearly due to duplication of some kind and diversification. There are large numbers of gene families involved in translation, and that's also not surprising if you think back to that carcinella genome that we just talked about. The carcinella genome, very streamlined genome, very small, but what's it got? It's got a lot of translation proteins. So quite a few transcription proteins that are in gene families, replication, which we'll talk about later, present in gene families. A lot fewer in some of the other cellular processing and signaling. Remember, these are the ones that are present in all three of the domains, three domains being bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Again, thinking about conservation. In this class, we're very interested about things which are common across all cellular life. There are also quite a few gene families, again, all of these homologs, which are present in these various different genomes. There also are quite a few, interestingly enough, that we don't actually know what they're doing. And this is, um, again, you were thinking this day and age, we'd have a bit better idea what's going on with a lot of these, but it turns out it's actually not true. There's still quite a few things that we really don't know what they're doing. They're probably pretty important because they're present in all three domains of life and they're, you know, quite a few different gene families that are there. So this is a really interesting area of, of future research and people are looking into what's trying to go on there. So now, hopefully this should be, again, quicker questions, which we don't have, but <laughs> um, should be pretty straightforward here. Um, which of the following is the best description of genes that are in a gene family? They're homologs, they're paralogs, they're orthologs, they're paradoxes, or they have identical sequences to each other. And again, we can talk about this on D2L, on discussion groups if people like. Spend a couple of minutes talking about model organisms. Now, why model organisms? Bit of a clue if you go back and think about the elephant icon in the corner where I showed this genome at the very beginning. That should be giving you a bit of an idea. Model organisms are biological organisms that lots of people study in depth to try and find out some fundamentals about related organisms, mostly through looking at conservation. Again, the conservation we talked about before, things that are present in lots of different organisms are likely to be important for all of those different kinds of organisms. It makes sense to study something which is easy to work with. One of the reasons people really like to work with E. coli as it grows very fast, many people have worked on it, so a lot is known about um, this organism. Again, as I mentioned before, 4.6 million base pairs, about 4,300 genes. So many people work on this just as a fundamental that's true for all organisms, if it's true in E. coli, but also if you're interested in bacteria. Um, it's a good model for thinking about other bacteria. But if you remember, again, way back to lecture one, back on, when was it? Two days ago? Feels like more like a week. Uh, when we looked at the diversity in terms of bacterial genes, bacterial genomes, just like archaea, um, they are very different relative to each other. So E. coli as a model for bacteria is not bad, but there are quite a few bacteria that are really quite different than E. coli. The model organism, at least as I'm concerned, for archaea is Sulfolobus sulfatericus, um, mostly because, like E. coli, it's really easy to grow. Um, it's got about 3,000 genes and about 3 million base pair genome. Um, lots of work has been done on Sulfolobus, and particularly in terms of the molecular biology and then virology too, which of course is what we're really interested in. The focus of this class and this textbook, however, is really much more on the eukaryotes. 
uh, and various different eukaryotes and the different model organisms that we have here. Probably the best studied of the eukaryotic model organisms, with the potential exception of this one all the way down here, um, is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is the brewer's yeast, very important for making beer, but also a great tool for molecular biology because relative to the other eukaryotic genomes, it's pretty small. It's only 12,000, no, sorry, excuse me, 12 million base pairs in size, about 6,300 genes that are present in the genome, but its molecular biology, again, if you remember our bush of a life that we talked about right at the beginning, fungi, animals, and plants are all extremely similar to each other at a molecular level. So small genome, turns out that yeasts are also really, really, really easy to grow, partly why they're good for making beer, um, but you can also treat them actually a lot like you can treat some of these bacteria um, and use them to grow things like that. C. elegans, Cenobitis elegans. We have a lab here working on Cenobitis. This is Suzanne Esty's lab. Um, wonderful organism for genetic studies, but also for looking at cell biology. It's only got 959 cells. That's in the hermaphrodite. The male has slightly more. Um, this is completely transparent. They're very easy to follow. In fact, we know exactly where each of those 959 cells come from, starting with the egg. So the right side of the egg is going to lead to one particular cell type, the left side of the egg is going to lead to a different cell, and you can trace these all the way back to the fertilized egg in the first place. So it's a great model for cell biology. Um, also a relatively small genome, certainly compared to our genome, but about the same number of protein coding genes. In dimension here, this is a protein coding genes, we're talking about not RNA coding genes. For plants, the pretty standard model is Arabidopsis thaliana, relatively small genome, particularly for plants, only about 220 million base pairs, also about 26,000 genes. There's a, another model genetic organism that in fact predates C. elegans or Cenobitis elegans in terms of genetics, um, Drosophila melanogaster, and in fact Drosophila was one of the main genetic tools that was used even in the days well before genomics and even the discovery that DNA was the genetic material. This is the classic organism. There's a great film called The Fly Room about Columbia University where they started working on Drosophila and it's still a very useful model organism again particularly because of the genetics that are being used in this system. It's got again a relatively small genome with only 200 million base pairs, about 15,000 genes, but it turns out a lot of the things that you can find out in doing studies of Drosophila. And uh, the other great thing about model organisms, they're easy to grow. Anyone who has a compost bin knows how easily it is to grow Drosophila. Um, and <clears throat> you can get lots and lots of them. And it turns out that they're very fundamental. It's how they develop, very similar between Drosophila and humans. Moving a little bit larger, um, many of my yeast biologist friends like to say that, you know, we're just big eukaryotes, not more higher eukaryotes, it's bigger eukaryotes. So a bigger eukaryote than Drosophila or um, C. elegans or Rabidopsis a little bit bigger is the zebrafish, Danio rerio. Um, we have a couple of labs here working on zebrafish, particularly Kim Brown's lab. Um, this has a larger genome, considerably 1.5 billion base pairs in size. Again, about 26,000 genes. Um, protein coding genes, why these are approximate, we can talk about later. Uh, this is a really nice modelism because again, you can grow large numbers of them. Um, in fact, the fish room that we have in the basement of, no, first floor of SRTC um, has lots and lots of these um, fish growing in it. Um, you can grow large numbers of them. They don't take very much space. They don't take very much resources. They also have transparent embryos and there's pretty decent genetic tools. Many of them, interestingly enough, developed just down the road um, in Eugene at the University of Oregon. Another very well used model organism, um, now a mammal, um, easier to get more of, easier to work with, um, is the mouse, most musculus, not quite sure what we changed here from our pointer. Go back to the pointer. Um, 3.5 million ba billion base pairs in terms of its genome, about 20,000 genes. 
Um, mice are also easier to use, shorter generation times, but they don't have the big advantage of the last model organism here. And the last model organism here is the model organism you can actually ask questions of and get decent answers. Um, these are just a couple of examples of those. Here is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Here is Cenerobatis elegans. Here's Drosophila melanogaster. Here's a Arabidopsis. Here's the zebrafish. Here's that zebrafish embryo. Um, completely transparent, so again, it's really easy to see where different things are, particularly in terms of development. And right here, you can see really nicely the notochord, which is going to become the spinal cord. Again, this is a vertebrate, unlike the other model organisms that we've talked about so far. This one in the middle here is um, another interesting example used much more for cell biology than for molecular biology. This is Xenopus, or the frog, um, which is used quite a bit for cell biology. One of the reasons that mice are such good model organisms um, for studying is it turns out that the genes in mice are almost identical in terms of their sequence, but also their function to genes in human. Here's an example of a transcriptional regulator that's mutated in this mouse, um, which gives this distinctive stripe here in terms of coloration. And here's a distinctive stripe with exactly the same gene mutated in this human here. And one of the things that allows us to get really good model organism data is if you just look here in terms of the history of, well, actually this is just the history of animals. Um, history of life goes back about, you know, almost 10 times as long as this. Uh, so if you think about the divergence in terms of the organisms, humans to chimps, um, relatively free, um, recent here, a couple of million years. If you look at the sequence identity, it's almost 100% here. Mice versus humans, about 30 million years ago but still 84% identical amino acids. And as we'll see here um, a little bit later on, we talk about protein structure probably on Friday, that anything above about 30% means that that protein sequence is likely to be practically identical. And you can just sort of go back in time here. Um, and this is nice because we actually do have fossil records so we can go back this far um, and look at these differences all relative to each other um, in terms of looking in different sequences. So this gene here, look, we've got a gene that does something between the mice and the humans. We can study it in mice and see what it's doing. But one of the big questions that genetics doesn't tell you about is how you're getting this lack of coloration at this particular place in development. And to do that, you really need to study the biochemistry. Um, so what is happening? Genetics. How it's happening is really your biochemistry. Finish up with the genomes, just looking really briefly at the different sizes of the genome. As I mentioned again briefly before, my Saccharomyces cerevisiae friends um, don't like to think of yeast down here. When they say yeast, that's Saccharomyces cerevisiae as being a lower eukaryote, just a smaller eukaryote, smaller in terms of size, but it's also considerably smaller in terms of its genome. That's down here at the bottom. Again, it's only about <clears throat> six, actually this is, um, you know, six million is here. So about 60 million um, base pairs um, right here in terms of the yeast genome. Human genome is out here. It's about 3 billion base pairs um, in size. Um, but as we saw before, the number of genes between C. elegans, it has a pretty small genome, and Drosophila, that also has smaller genomes, and humans, the number of protein coding genes is extremely similar relative to each other. And it turns out a lot of that's because in the human genome, there's a lot of non-protein coding sequences. Very interesting, still very confusing, trying to figure out what's going on with a lot of these sequences. But if you go and look at E. coli and a lot of the bacterial genomes, there's a lot less non-protein coding sequences. So you've learned something fundamental about how 
all molecular biology work. It's going to be a lot easier to work with some of these systems down here that have relatively small genomes. If, however, you want to find something out about non-coding DNA, um, you want to get over here and look at some of these genomes. This textbook is really into trying to model what's going on in terms of how genes work, how they're being regulated relative to each other. And so this is just a quick overview of how people are trying to think about how you go from these genes, which again is what we're all looking at back here and all the other particular genes that we have in evolution, to try and get an idea how these things are functioning. From genetics, you can get what they're doing again, but how they're actually going from this sequence here, which it turns out is really easy to determine, to what it's doing depends on not only what's going on with the various different proteins that are made, but how those proteins are interacting with DNA in terms of making other different things happen um, in the cell. The process now of trying to put all of these systems together is something called the ENCODE project. This is the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And basically what this is is a whole group of different people, and you can go and look at the website down here at the bottom, the encodeproject.org. Um, and in there, they talk about the literally millions, and now we're talking about hundreds of millions, in some cases almost billions of different modifications, changes, binding sites, etc., through the whole human genome. As I mentioned before, there's you know, about three and a half billion base pairs in a haploid copy of the human genome. But that's just the sequence. Sequence is easy. What that sequence is doing is a lot harder. So a couple of things that are being done in this ENCODE project are looking at DNA methylation, which is just a change that happens to the DNA that's not a genetic change. Often people will talk about this as being an epigenetic change. Changes to the chromatin, and here particularly changes in the proteins that are interacting with the DNA. We'll spend a long time talking about that later on. Interested in what are these called hypersensitive sites, and basically what this tells you is pieces of DNA that don't have a bunch of chromatin proteins that are associated with them. In these sites that don't have a lot of chromatin, they're also trying to find all of the pieces of DNA that bind to specific proteins, be they proteins that are involved in making the actual RNA, or if they are involved in helping this whole process. This project is also looking at all of the proteins which are being made and all of the transcripts, i.e. the messenger RNA, which is being made. And again, this is literally probably altogether a couple of billion different pieces of data looking at how cells are growing under different conditions, what are the modifications, what's all the DNA binding, etc. So we'll talk a lot more about these individual things as we move along, but this is basically a way to mention that there is a lot more other stuff going on um, in terms of looking at these genomes. Usually I do these reviews right after um, one particular lecture, but this was basically from the first chapter. So uh, what we talked about last time, other than stuff about the class. Again, more questions about that, send them to me. I'll post them on D2L. I already had a question that I posted on there already under the questions section in discussions. Talked about the central dogma. Central dogma being DNA replicates to DNA. DNA can be transcribed to RNA. RNA can be translated into protein. And you can't go from protein back to RNA, at least not in terms of information you can go from RNA back to DNA through reverse transcription. Today we talked about genomes. All of the genomes 
mostly for model organisms, but pretty much for almost all organisms. In this day and age, if you want to study something, one of the very first things that often happens is you go ahead and sequence the genome, because that's easy. The problem is figuring out what's going on with that genome and how does that genome change from one of those cells that we looked at at the beginning. Remember those three egg cells that all look pretty identical to each other. They gave us three very, very different things. How do you go from that genome to the function? And that's still something that we're trying to figure out and that's part of molecular biology why we're hopefully all here in this class. One way to try and figure out what's going on in these genomes is to try and use similar genes to each other, which are hopefully homologs, i.e. they've come from a common ancestor. These are your gene families. And with any luck, if you find a nice gene family, you'll find a model organism that also has some members of this gene family in it. And in studying that model organism, hopefully you can go back now and look at your favorite organism and your favorite genome, and then try to understand what's going on with that. So again, if there are any questions, um, please feel free to send me an email and we can talk more about it. Now I want to switch gears for about the next half hour or so and talk about what you need to know as far as chemistry is concerned for this class. We'll start out talking about atoms, fortunately not the whole periodic table as far as molecular biology is concerned relatively few, only about five or six different atoms that we care about. Um, the, <clears throat> how these interact, excuse me, how these atoms interact with each other is one major part of molecular biology, and that's really all about chemistry. But the chemistry we care about here really has to do with various different interactions that molecules have with each other. Um, those molecules get together, not terribly surprisingly, through covalent bonds. Um, and then it's all about the weak interactions that have to do with the actual function. So we'll talk about the covalent bonds and covalent bond formation, mostly in terms of making macromolecules. And then it's all the weak interactions, um, which are most important in terms of how these things actually get to function. Van der Waals interactions, hydron, hydrogen bonds or hydrogen bonding interaction and ionic interactions. Um, water is absolutely critical for biology as we know it. And in fact, one of the things that astrobiology is working on, so looking for life off of Earth, is looking for water. Because as far as we know, water is really pretty critical for biology, certainly biology as we know it. And part of that has to do with hydrophobic interactions, but that's really only part of it. We'll talk more about that as we go along. Some of the strong interactions, um, this has to do mostly with the making of macromolecules and sort of working against entropy. And a couple of the key factors there having to do with activation energy, so-called high energy bonds, and the real necessity, say most of what happens in terms of molecular biology is macromolecules, so big molecules interacting with each other. This is entropically a very bad thing. And so you have to have a way of making these macromolecules. And the way to do that is with coupling, um, with high energy bonds and precursor activation and protein structure we'll talk about on Friday. So what are these five, six atoms that are really important in biology? You can ignore the vast majority of the periodic table for molecular biology purposes. Um, what you really need to know about are Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, those are the, by far and away the most common atoms in biology. Nitrogen is a weak fourth, followed by phosphorus and sulfur um, at even lower levels. The other ones which are highlighted on this periodic table, yes, you do find in biological systems, but these are really the traces in most of these biological systems in terms of where all of these um, are. Um, just wanted to mention, of course, this periodic table is really completely out of date. Uh, this whole row down here at the bottom actually um, should be completed by now.
So let's talk about chemical bonds. Again, hopefully all of this is review for you. If it's not review, then we probably need to be talking about what you should be thinking about as far as this class is concerned. Um, covalent bonds are just the sharing of electrons um, between different atoms. Um, and that's basically just shown here, various electron shells, filling those electron shells. You can fill electron shell by sharing electrons between different atoms, or you can have an ionic bond where you actually transfer an electron from one atom to another atom. And usually this transfer here goes between um, electron shells that are almost full to electron shells, I say from electron shells that are almost empty to electron shells that are almost full. Um, the vast majority of things we're going to be talking about here are going to be these, these chemical covalent bonds. If you think about covalent bonds, these are really quite strong relative to the interactions and holding those two atoms together in terms of forming a molecule. If you look at the energetics of these, it's basically shown up here on a log scale on the top here in kilojoules per mole. Standard covalent bond interactions here, carbon-carbon, the vast majority of the bonds we're going to be talking about, is about 350 kilojoules per mole. The reason that these are so strong is that in an aqueous solution at 37 degrees, average thermal energy is about two to three kilojoules per mole. And basically what that means is, is that any of these average thermal motions, just banging atoms around relative to being at 37 degrees, you need a hundred of these acting in exactly the same way in order to be able to break some of these bonds here. On the other hand, all of those weak interactions that we talked about are really very weak relative to the average thermal motions. In fact, they're almost around this average thermal motion energy. So if you just had one of any of these different bonds here, van der Waals, say interactions, hydrogen bonds, ionic interactions, etc., these are going to get beaten apart really quickly. Um, at 37 degrees in an aqueous solution. This is really nice because you can have interactions between different molecules that go back and forth, can be present, we call it a transient function. You've got them, you don't have them, but what you also have for all of these weak interactions is you have many, many, many of them. So it's a combination of these weak interactions um, which allows you to have reversible kinds of interactions, but also have them be transient interactions. Talk briefly about chemical polarity. This is not the same as polarity when we talk about it in nucleic acids. I talked about it last time. We'll talk about it a lot more before. Chemical polarity just has to do with a separation of charge. And the classic polar molecule um, or polar bond is polar covalent bond, I should say, is just that the electrons in that covalent bond right, aren't right in the middle between the two atoms. They're spread slightly differently from one versus the other. And if you have one of the atoms that pulls more of those electrons, it's slightly more negative. Where those electrons are being pulled away from is going to be slightly more positive. Water is a great example of that. Oxygen has more of these electrons. The hydrogen has slightly less of these electrons. On the other hand, You've got two atoms that are interacting in exactly the same way, sharing the electrons in the same way. There's no particular polarity which is there. This polarity is really important for one of probably at least the most famous, if not the most common, of the weak interactions of these so-called hydrogen bonds. I don't like hydrogen bonds, but that's what everybody uses. Um, and basically, it's because you have a slight positive charge here on a hydrogen atom, slight negative charge here on an oxygen atom. It doesn't have to be oxygen and nitrogen. It can be oxygen and oxygen. It can be nitrogen and nitrogen. Any of these are possibilities, but it's whenever you have a slight positive charge on your hydrogen, slight negative charge on whatever else, 
it is, that other atom, that can give you this kind of interaction. Polar interactions are interesting because they're always directional. And they have to be directional because if you get off, you're not going to have that same kind of attraction. Um, and so here, this has to be pretty much in a line between whatever is bound to that hydrogen atom. Again, could be oxygen, could be nitrogen here, and whatever the acceptor atom is here. We'll see that again when we look at the nucleic acids, but it's also true in all the proteins as well. Van der Waals interactions, on the other hand, are not directional. They just have to do with distance, and it's getting very, very close between two different atoms. And looking up top at the, at the, uh, the graph, um, separation between atoms of about four angstroms, which is really getting very close relative to each other. And here, what this is, you have a certain distance, and again, relatively short, where you have attraction is a relatively small amount of attraction here. Soon as you get much closer, these things start to repel each other. And so very often, if you look at what they're called space filling models, so those nice little spheres that you look at on various different atomic models, molecule models, those are the van der Waals radius. And the van der Waals radius is right here, right at this optimal van der Waals interaction. Um, as soon as you move away from this distance, you get too close, you have very rapid repulsion. If you get further away, this attractive force goes to zero very, very rapidly. So again, these are relatively weak interactions and they have to be very, very close in terms of, so this is very much your hand in glove um, kind of interaction here. There are also hydrophobic interactions. Um, I don't like the term hydrophobic interaction. I actually like to think of this much more as a hydrogen bond interactions with water because water makes wonderful hydrogen bonds. You've got oxygens here in red, hydrogens here in white. These hydrogen bonds between the water, um, these are usually much stronger than pretty much any of the other interactions. And particularly here, if you've got these two molecules that are not interacting with water, the water molecules want to maximize the hydrogen bonds between the water. And so in that process of maximizing the hydrogen bonds between the water, it ends up pushing these two molecules together. And that pushing of the two molecules together is what's called this hydrophobic interaction process. So these are also your nonpolar molecules. Why are they nonpolar? Because they haven't got this unequal distribution of the electron, unequal distribution of charge. So you have polar molecules, and we'll see in just a second, that particularly the nonpolar amino acids are those which end up being packaged together or squeezed together because the water is interacting with each other. So if we now take a combination of all of these things, this is what we really have in biological macromolecules. In this case, it's two different proteins interacting with each other with lots of different non-covalent interactions. So we've got a hydrogen bond interaction here. We've got hydrophobic interactions right here in the middle, i.e. water molecules on the outside pushing these things together. You also have ionic interactions where you've got charges that are interacting with each other. And this process, a whole different sets of different interactions, what this means, you have very high specificity between this molecule and that molecule. This guy's only gonna match with this one, this one's only gonna match with this one, and they're only gonna interact in one particular way, but they can come and go interact and no longer interact with each other. Little bit more chemistry before we finish up here, just talking about acids and bases. This turns out to be really important in terms of various charge interactions, particularly in terms of proteins that we'll get to a little bit later on. But the whole idea of an acid, an acid is a molecule, is a hydrogen which can be released from this molecule giving you an ion and donating it to water. As I mentioned before, water seems to be absolutely critical, at least for life as we know it, 
partly that's because water is present in very high concentrations. And so whenever you have any kind of interaction of any biological molecule, with some very rare exceptions, it's going to be interacting with water. So here, acetic acid has this hydrogen that it can give up. Any acid is giving up this hydrogen. On the flip side, anything which is a base is actually going to be taking a hydrogen from water and adding it to its own molecule. Um, this you can think of as also in a aqueous solution. Again, all biology is an aqueous solution. You're going to have a mixture of OH3, the hydronium ion with a positive charge, hydroxyl ion with a negative charge, and those that are uncharged relative to each other. In a normal, regular water, half of it's going to be this, half of it's going to be that. So let's talk about the molecules that we will be talking about for the rest of this class. You can basically ignore this one right here. We're not going to talk any more about fatty acids. On the other hand, we're going to talk a lot about amino acids nucleotides and a little bit about sugars, but basically only sugars as they fit together in terms of nucleotides. The main molecules of life as far as we're concerned are nucleic acids and proteins. Sugars and lipids are very important, yes, but most part we're going to talk about nucleic acids and proteins. Um, how do you get nucleic acids and proteins? Basically, you have to start out with individual building blocks. These are the so-called monomers for proteins. Those are the amino acids right here. For nucleic acids, the nucleotides. For polysaccharides, fats, lipid, and membranes, the sugars and fatty acids that, again, that we talk about much more in cell biology. If you look at any particular cell, the vast majority of that is water. But of what's left, and this is true for, this is the bacterial cell, but eukaryotic cells are basically exactly the same as well, archaea as well. 30% um, is non-water, and of that 30%, about half of that is protein. So vast majority of the non-water part of a cell um, is going to be protein, lots of RNA, little bit of DNA, and some polysaccharides. But between the proteins and the nucleic acid, that's the vast majority of what we have there. Most of these are macromolecules. How do you get a macromolecule? Basically, condensation reactions. And I've talked to a couple of people here about you know, what kind of reactions you should you know about in terms of molecular biology. Basically, it's these two reactions. Condensation reactions, hydrolysis reactions. And the condensation reaction is how you start to go from individual building blocks, shown here as the individual nucleotides, into macromolecules, A and B. You continue this process, you'll get ABC, et cetera, et cetera. So build up these monomers into polymers. In this case, it's a polymerization. Let's talk about nucleotide polymerization ad nauseum later on. Backing up this reaction is a hydrolysis reaction where you can take this polymer, the macromolecule, and break it down into smaller pieces, again, just by hydrolysis. The way I like to think about condensation, you generate a water or you add a water, and that way you can end up putting macromolecules together again through condensation reactions or taking them apart through hydrolysis reactions. Now, hopefully all of you know that condensation reactions are energetically unfavorable, whereas hydrolysis reactions are highly favorable. Why is that? Uh, mostly has to do with the fact that hydrolysis reactions increase entropy, whereas condensation reactions decrease entropy. And so the one other way of looking at this is the so-called free energy. Anytime you increase free energy, that's going to be an unfavorable reaction. A decrease in free energy 
is going to be <clears throat> a favorable reaction, or in some many cases, a spontaneous um, reaction. If you think about most biological reactions, particularly this kind of condensation reaction in terms of forming macromolecules, that's an unfavorable reaction, but because we've got so many macromolecules in our cell, clearly <laughs> there has to be some kind of favorable process which is happening. And that's when you put multiple reactions together, then you end up with what's called a pathway, going here from A to E, and that's an actual favorable process which is going on here. Now, how do you get that to happen? Um, you take nutrition, um, here shown as various different food molecules, these are also almost always macromolecules. Those macromolecules get broken down very often through hydrolysis pro um, processes in catabolic pathways, give you some kind of usable form of energy. You lose some heat here, as this is why these are spontaneous reactions. They also generate building blocks, um, and building blocks here are very often going to be your amino acids, your nucleotides, which you're then going to use um, later on in the process. So this formation of macromolecules goes from food to macromolecules. Again, we eat things, often macromolecules in other organisms, and so this is a whole recycling process. In order to get these amino acids and nucleosides, in such a way that you can put them together in an overall favorable process, you have to activate some of these. And we'll talk about that activation process here in just a second. This is one of my favorite pictures from this textbook, or one of the favorite figures from the textbook. Um, if you have a spontaneous reaction, it goes from the nice clean room to the not quite so clean room, and the requiring free energy input you have to do to get back to here. So food, bribery, corruption, etc. in order to get this to happen, and this will happen spontaneously. How do we get this to happen? What's that input of energy? For this planet, most of it comes from photosynthesis. Um, energy comes from sunlight. There are also a number of chemosynthetic organisms that get this from chemical compounds where you can now create organic molecules that can then be used through now <clears throat> hydrolysis to give you this chemical bond energy. This chemical bond energy is then what's used to make all of the macromolecules slightly more complex version here, but basically energy in, chemical bond energy out. How do you take that and convert that chemical bond energy into something useful? It's through the <clears throat> GERLEO. Uh, -E Anybody remember that from your, hopefully, general chemistry? Oxidation and reduction. Loss of an electron, Leo, is oxidation. Gain of an electron is reduction. What you have to have in order to have spontaneous reactions is you need to go from one of these sides to the other side. As long as it goes down from one to the other, then you can actually get some kind of energy from it. Always have to be transferred. If you have an oxidation reaction, say you go from methanol to formaldehyde, oxidation again is a loss of an electron. The loss of the electron here gives you a loss of a hydrogen atom here, formaldehyde. Um, that process has to be coupled to the gain of an electron somewhere else. Um, so oxidation and reduction are always balanced relative um, with each other. And that's how we're going to get energy back out of these systems. Yes, you can have a spontaneous reaction take place just from a purely energetic, a thermodynamic point of view, but to actually have reactions take place on a reasonable time scale, i.e. you don't have to wait thousands of years to digest your lunch, 
you have to have some way of stimulating the rates of some of these reactions. The, what happens through catalysis, catalysis is almost always done in biology through the process of protein enzymes. And all that these guys do is they lower what's called this activation energy barrier to go from your reactant to your product. And all that this does is it changes the speed of your reaction. It doesn't change the overall amount of your reaction. There should actually be an arrow back up here, just as there is an arrow down here. Um, and that just, again, speeds things up relative to each other. In order to get biological reactions, when I say biological reactions here, I mostly mean synthesis reactions, monomers going to polymers, you have to have some way of getting that spontaneous reaction, the energetically favorable reaction, connected to this unfavorable reaction. And one way of looking at that is this gear process where you have a favorable reaction with a negative free energy together with a positive free energy required this gear just says, as long as this has more negative than the positive that you have here, you can actually get this X to Y reaction to take place. Briefly wanted to talk about chemical equilibrium. Again, hopefully this is all review for you. At an equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, you're going to have a set amount of your product here and your individual reagents. It's going to depend on the product, it's going to depend on the reagents, what the various level is of each of those. You can describe this as the ratio of the two different rates of the reactions. So rate of the reaction going forward, rate of the reaction going back. This is the ratio of these two, also dependent on the concentration of each of your reactants and products down here at the bottom. Again, this is review. If it's not, you'd like me to talk more about it, I'm more than happy to do so, probably more offline. You can calculate your delta Gs based on some standard state of the reaction. That's delta G0. Basically, you can look this up. Um, and then just the concentration of your products and reactants in order to give you your delta G, is this going to be a spontaneous reaction or not a spontaneous reaction given your products and reactants. You can get your delta G zero from the equilibrium constant. And remember again, that has to do with the ratio of the two different rates that you have here, which is also then something you can get from the concentration of your different <clears throat> reactants and products. Equilibrium constant, since this is an equation, you can get your delta G zero if you know your equilibrium constant. You can get the equilibrium constant if you know your delta G zero. So basically, all you need to know is the rates at your particular equilibrium. Why do we care about this? Most of you are going to say, oh, what the heck? What's all this you know, thermodynamics all about? basically has to do with thermodynamics of binding and interactions of various different macromolecules with each other. The vast majority of those that we're going to talk about here are going to be proteins interacting with nucleic acids. But one of the things that we will talk quite a bit about is what's the so-called binding constant, or in many cases people actually talk about dissociation constants. So here, we're looking at basically what you could sort of call a reaction. It's a ligand, which is usually this small molecule. We've got A, B, and C here, and your protein, that's the P here. And then when they bound together, it's LP. So your dissociation constant is going to be these two. Again, these are your reactants divided by the concentration of your products. So if you can measure the concentration of both together, 
and the ones that are not bound that can give you this dissociation constant. Dissociation constant is also, because it's just an equilibrium constant, it's the rate of, say, this ligand coming out of the complex or going into the complex or the off rate and the on rate. You can do some math here on this equation. You can then find that the dissociation constant is actually the concentration of L when half of P is bound. This is extremely useful if you want to think about how much of a particular protein is interacting with a particular piece of DNA or for that matter any other ligand. Because what it says is if you look at the amount of free ligand, so free DNA for instance, if it's at a millimolar concentration when you have half of your protein bound, that's actually pretty weak interactions. On the other hand, nanomolar interactions are extremely strong interactions. And this may seem like, oh, who cares about this? This is absolutely critical in terms of having drugs function properly. You want to have drugs that are interacting with nanomolar dissociation constants because then your drug is going to be interacting with your drug target as opposed to interacting with at a relatively low amount, it's not going to be interacting with your targets. I mean, a lot of it was just being, being wasted in the whole process. Let's go ahead and continue to talk about activated intermediates here. I know we're getting a little longer than the normal lecture time here, but I'd like to get through this um, whole lecture so that we can do proteins on Friday or that we can do proteins in the delayed snow lecture, which is quite possible it's going to be, because none of this seems to be melting as we move along here. So I mentioned activated intermediates, again, and sort of the food going towards your macromolecules. Um, if you're just degrading the food into these individual pieces, there's no way they can be put back together again, unless you can find some way of a nice coupled reaction. Well, the classic coupling of reactions, as far as we're concerned for molecular biology, is this so-called activation process. It almost always happens in the presence of adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate gets hydrolyzed in a very <clears throat> energetically favorable reaction, and then an unfavorable interaction happens here, and you end up with a so-called high energy intermediate. The reason this is a high energy intermediate is that this high energy intermediate, when you have hydrolysis of this bond, that will then give you your final product here. Now, in this case, we're not doing <clears throat> a polymer. We're just exchanging this ammonia, excuse me here, for the phosphate group going from glucamic acid to glutamine. But as we'll see here for the polymerization process for proteins, Turns out for polysaccharides too, but that's a different story. And also for nucleic acid, this is exactly the process which is being used here. So it needs activated intermediates. This coupling happens. The coupling is through the hydrolysis of the nucleotide triphosphate, in many cases ATP, not always. And because these are coupled reactions, and they're usually multiple reactions one after the other, this ends up with being basically an irreversible reaction. So let's take a look at this process here for nucleic acid polymerization. We'll talk much more about nucleic acid polymerization um, as we move into talking about DNA polymerization and transcription later on. But in terms of the chemistry here, you start out with your individual building block. This is your nucleoside monophosphate here. Nucleotide monophosphate needs to get two more phosphates added to it through hydrolysis of two adenosine triphosphates. These two adenosine triphosphates are used to add what's called the beta and gamma phosphates to your nucleotide triphosphate. This nucleotide triphosphate is now your high energy intermediate. It interacts with 
either a single nucleotide monophosphate, as we have here. In this case, it's a polynucleotide chain that has two of these. This process here, you have hydrolysis of this bond between this phosphate and that phosphate, and the alpha phosphate and the beta phosphate. That releases what's called a pyrophosphate. This gets hydrolyzed yet again to give you two phosphates. This then eventually needs to be recycled back the input of other energy to make you more ATP. Um, but it's this first hydrolysis here that adds this on here, a second hydrolysis, which basically makes this an irreversible reaction. You're not going to be able to put these two phosphates back together, put these two phosphates back onto the nucleotides in order to break these bonds. So this is the process how you polymerize your nucleic acids. We talked about for the last, well, it wasn't quite an hour and five minutes, probably about an hour and 10 by now. Um, chemistry process, only about six atoms we need to worry about in terms of molecular biology. All of molecular biology, other than making polymers, which is through high energy bonds, coupling and activation energy, very often with these precursors, which are activated, once you've made these macromolecules, all the interactions we're going to care about here are the weak interactions, van der Waals interactions, hydrogen bonding interactions, ionic interactions, and hydrophobic interactions, which are really critical as far as water is concerned. So again, if you have questions, please send them to me um, via D2L, and I will do my best to answer them. And we may or may not see each other on Friday.